At precisely 3.03 p.m. on an uncomfortably hot day in St. Louis, 32 runners began running in the 1904 Olympic Marathon. Every part of this event was a disaster. Much of the race was run on dirt roads, kicking up dust and creating generally miserable conditions. Even on the parts that weren't, runners still needed to dodge trains, trolley cars, and dog walkers. Over the 24.85 mile course, there were exactly two places where runners could get water, both in the front half of the course. The chief organizer of the Olympics purportedly did this with the intent of conducting research into purposeful dehydration. With everything stacked against them, of the 32 runners, 18 would not finish the race. As the three hour mark approached, onlookers at the finish line were beginning to question whether anyone would even win. It wasn't until the 3 hour 13 minute mark that American athlete Frederick Lors crossed the finish line and was crowned the victor. The only issue was, he cheated. Lors had dropped out of the race at the 9 mile mark. He hitched a ride for about 10 miles before the car broke down, leaving Lors to jog for the remaining few miles. When challenged by officials, Lors immediately conceded that he had cheated, claiming that he had only been acting as if he had won as a joke. For as outlandish as the circumstances surrounding him may be, Frederick Lors is probably the closest analogy to the most common method of cheating in all of speedrunning, splicing. Cheating is one of the most talked about topics in speedrunning. Entire cottage industries have formed out of making videos catching cheaters and the sleuthing detective work required to expose them. How speedrunners cheat is something of an enigma. With so many ways to falsify a run, it's often difficult to catch a cheater even when you know what you're looking for. A few methods stand out from the rest in terms of prevalence. This is how speedrunners cheat. But before we start, I know it's annoying when you watch a YouTuber and they stop everything to beg and plead for you to like and subscribe. I'm not here to do that. I would totally never do something. By the way, I'll be real with you. Um, please subscribe. You know, I can sit here and go, hey guys, guys, please. Or I'll just be honest with you. You know, if you enjoy, just please check the subscribe button. I don't want to bother you. Uh, but if you can just check the subscribe button, that helps out the channel so much. That's all I ask. The most common way a speedrunner cheats is by splicing. Splicing is the act of taking two separate pieces of footage and stitching them together into a single video. In many games, splicing is very hard to detect when done well. It can be opportunistic to splice during a loading screen or a cutscene due to the near static nature of the screen being consistent between attempts. This allows for video feeds to be stitched together frame perfectly as a person just needs to begin the footage from video 2 on the frame after they stop video 1. The complexities arise when factoring in non-video factors. In games with collectibles, it's necessary to keep the on-screen counts consistent. This can be as easy to do as stars in Super Mario 64, or as difficult as shiny objects in Battle for Bikini Bottom. The biggest issue with splicing a run usually comes down to the audio though. This can be as small as singular frames where music should be playing but it isn't, to entirely messing up the music. One of the most famous examples of a speedrunner being caught splicing comes from The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Back in 2004, with the time of 5 hours 25 minutes, the first 100% run of Ocarina of Time with video was uploaded to Speed Demo's archive by a runner named TSA. At the time, runs where gameplay was completed in segments were very common, especially for games as long as OOT. In fact, TSA would upload a segmented run of Wind Waker around the same time, with that run being nearly an hour and a half longer. It would not have been unusual for TSA to have simply uploaded a segmented run of the game. Instead, he made a point to announce that this was a real one-time run. And for a while, everyone took it as that. It would not be until the Twitch era of speedrunning that foul play would be found. While watching through TSA's runs, Narcissa and her chat would notice a peculiar thing. When leaving Gerudo's fortress and entering Haunted Wasteland, the music in the background skipped a considerable chunk. Even worse, when watching another PB by TSA, another splice would be found in the exact same part of the run. When just looking at the video, the splices look clean. The screen fills with sand when leaving Gerudo's fortress, leaving the background fully yellow and easy to clearly stitch segments. Unfortunately for TSA, the music track continues to play between levels. This means that in order to splice on that load, he would have needed to perfectly sync the music when entering Haunted Wasteland before he could attempt the segment. Even more less obvious splices would be found in the run. In Ocarina of Time, the first time a player pauses after a game reset, the menu will always open to the map screen. Whenever a player pauses after going through a load zone though, the menu will always open to the item screen instead. In both of these runs, TSA's menu would open to the map screen multiple times when they should have opened to the item screen. This means that the game was being reset and the resets were not included in the footage, necessitating even more splices throughout the run. 
Another way speedrunners cheat is by submitting a tool assisted speedrun or TAS as a normal attempt. TASs use tools like safe states and frame events to have precise control over all actions performed in a run. This allows tricks and movement to be performed at a level of execution that is impossible for a human to match. Through a tedious process of reloading prior safe states over even the smallest inaccuracies, TAS provides insight into the furthest bounds a game could be pushed within the bounds of current knowledge. Of course, if a runner submitted a fully optimized task that featured flawless execution of even the least viable tricks, members of their community would be quick to notice and question the legitimacy of the run. Instead, to have a better chance of getting away with submitting a task, a person would need to submit footage that resembles human-like gameplay, sometimes even throwing in a mistake or two so that the run doesn't look too perfect. When done well, the results of the run would not be too dissimilar to what a splice run might look like, but with the added benefit of not needing to worry about audio or menu consistency, since a task is a single continuous run of the game. The only downside to having all these tools and attempts is that you need to use them well. The worst of all possibilities would come to a head in the Sonic Adventure 2 community when a runner by the name of Bruce would submit several runs that were clearly tasked while also still losing tons of time throughout the run. In Bruce's Radical Highway run, this was especially apparent. During a section that features a scripted camera, Bruce transitions from one rail around the tower of the bridge and onto another rail. With the camera in the state, it is nearly impossible to measure depth as well as being way more difficult to maneuver shadow. While this could potentially have been doable if Bruce had a setup, the manner in which he does it makes it clear that it was lucky at best. Even years later, runners still go over the tower. Despite this immensely difficult trick though, Bruce is losing tons of time throughout his run. Over the course of the attempt, he was failing to charge his spin dashes, leading him to move very slowly. Had he been playing the game at full speed, he would have surely noticed his lack of speed, but if he had been playing in a slowed down state or going frame by frame, it would be harder to notice. Despite the lack of attention he put into making his run fast, Bruce put a lot of effort into trying to sell it. The run was made using the Dolphin emulator on the PC. This gave him the option to screen record his tasks or even directly export each frame over the video at high quality. Instead, he ported the run to a CRT and recorded it with a camcorder in a scene that would have been much more at home in 2006 than in 2019. The community quickly noticed his runs were weird and called him out on it. Rather than simply admitting to cheating, Bruce made a video titled, A Defense of My Times, and this video is a fever dream. The video features Bruce sitting in a poorly lit room and using a voice modifier. So, um, I understand there has been some, uh, accusations. The 10 minute video features dramatic zooms, changing light colors, and the sound of children's voices and more. What was absurd though was the story Bruce would launch into. He started detailing how he had been a speedrunner of the game since the very first day it was released. At this time, Bruce didn't have access to the internet. It was just him, Sonic, and his notebook of strategies. The depth of exploration he put into the game was staggering. My math crafted what was possible and what was not. Pause buffering, pause hover, skewed gravity, clip outs, impact landings, perfect pure movement. You get the idea. I was using these concepts long before anyone had even an idea of what they were. Play like a computer, my father always said. Once he concluded his backstory, Bruce would go into detail how his exploration of science has led him to the conclusion that he couldn't possibly have cheated. He claimed that the Three Gorges Dam was responsible for any timing inconsistencies in his runs. The Three Gorges Dam is a hydroelectric gravity dam in the Yangtze River in China. It's the largest power producing station in the world. In 2005, NASA stated that the shift in water mass stored by the dam would have noticeable effects on the Earth, lengthening days by 0.06 milliseconds while changing the planet's shape to be rounder at the tropics and flatter at the poles. Bruce claims that the dam had been filled precisely during his runs and that when this time change was accounted for, any inconsistencies in his runs would be explained. Having concluded his argument, Bruce calmly states that I guess what I'm trying to say here is, um, well, I really am better than you all. <laughs> yep. There's probably no topic in speedrunning that has been thoroughly discussed as cheating in Minecraft. The open nature of the game makes it susceptible to a multitude of niche types of cheating. The most widely known is the modification of drop rates in the game. Infamously, popular YouTuber Dream would be caught doing this in October of 2020. After an investigation by the Minecraft speedrunning moderation team, it was calculated that the odds of Dream's drop rates occurring naturally were 1 in 7.5 trillion. This isn't the only way people cheat in Minecraft though. 
In this community, categories are generally broken down into set seed and random seed. In Minecraft, there are 2 to the 64th, or 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion, 73 billion, 709 million, 551,616 possible seeds. In set seed, runners select which one of these seeds they wish to play. This makes the run much more similar to a standard speedrun, with the set route and limited improvisation needed to complete the run. A random seed run takes whichever one of those seeds Minecraft wishes to give you and runs with it. The odds a seed you or anyone else have ever seen before are incredibly unlikely, verging on impossible. A common way of cheating in the random seed categories is by injecting a seed that the runner already knows into the game. Back when Minecraft speedrunning was less regulated, runners would use a macro that allowed them to input a seed into the game, but then have the game start as if it was a random seed generating. As Minecraft speedrunning has matured, cheating has become way more difficult. Runs are now encouraged to use certain mods for resetting, as well as submitting audio and game files for top level runs. This allows the moderation team to see if runners have modified the game in any unfair manner. That hasn't stopped runners from trying to cheat though. A top 10 Minecraft speedrunner by the name of Floby was exposed for seed injecting by 11 billion. Over the course of the nearly hour long video, 11 dissects 7 of Floby's runs, demonstrating how the manner in which Floby was playing lacked either a fundamental understanding of how top level Minecraft players speedrun, or required previously playing the seed and planning out what to do ahead of time. The moderation team was so suspicious of Floby's rapid improvement that they requested the files for a run that didn't even finish. The results showed exactly what the team expected, with Floby having played the seed multiple times prior to his run. In the end, Floby would admit to seed injection in all of their runs under 15 minutes except an 11.58 in a twit longer. Especially in older games, loads factor heavily into the timing of a run. Even if a console loses half a second per load, that builds up over the course of a run, potentially leading to minutes being lost. On the other side, any second saved over another runner is a big advantage. This makes the use of modified consoles very contentious and often illegal in speedrunning. Remember back to the 1904 marathon? Well, the next fastest runner was an American by the name of Thomas Hicks, finishing at 3 hours 28 minutes 53 seconds, a full 15 minutes behind Lord's cheated time. This is over half an hour slower than any other winning time in the history of the modern Olympics. Hicks almost didn't finish though. Roughly 10 miles from the end, while leading the race, Hicks was desperate for a drink but his team refused to give him any water. Instead, they opted to give him a dose of strychnine mixed with egg whites. Strychnine is a highly toxic pesticide commonly used to kill rodents. It also has the added benefit of stimulating the nervous system. The boost was short lived though, leading them to give him another dose of strychnine, this time with some brandy. A hallucinating mess, Hicks would somehow find his way to the finish line, claiming a gold medal after being the first documented athlete to dope in the modern Olympics. Strychnine, a rat poison, wouldn't be banned until 1928. While this story may seem weird to include in a video on cheating and speedrunning, doping in sports isn't all too dissimilar to another common means of cheating. Console modification is the act of taking a console's original hardware and replacing it with superior components. This can give runners advantages in things like load times, lag reduction, and input frequency. The difficult part of console modification is usually catching it. It's not as clear cut as a splice, where a keen eye or ear can definitely notice something isn't right. Games often have inconsistent loads or lag depending how much use a disc has seen. Even if someone has loads that seem too fast, unless they are multiple seconds faster than they should be, it's hard to be certain. Concrete proof is still harder to come by. Most runners don't show their consoles at all times. Even if someone suspected of console modification shows off a console, it is impossible to know for sure that the console they are showing is the same one they use for runs. An example that truly underlines the complexity of console modification is the story of Luigi's Mansion's world record holder, Snap. Snap has long been a bit of a mysterious figure in the speedrunning community, appearing out of nowhere with incredible times but hardly ever streaming his attempts. Back in 2017, Snap had started running SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom. BFBB is unique in the speedrunning community. Whereas most of the popular speedruns are performed on PC or a Nintendo console, BFBB is optimally played on the original Microsoft Xbox. Of all the major consoles, the Xbox is probably the least popular for speedrunning, making it also among the least well known on a technical level. BFBB, a game released in 2003, didn't even know Xbox was the optimal console until midway through 2016. It had been assumed that the newer the Xbox, the faster the loads would be. So when Snap showed up with the used mid-life cycle console with faster loads than the community had ever seen, something seemed off. After submitting a few runs, his times would be removed from the boards. The moderation team had come to the conclusion that Snap's load times were illegitimate and that his console was modified. Snap was furious. 
He instantly started calling out the mod team, defensively claiming his console to be legitimate. A debate would rage for several hours in the annals of the general channel. When Snap eventually calmed down, Shift, the world record holder for Battle for Bikini Bottom, offered to buy the Xbox from Snap, exchanging it for one without modified loads. Snap agreed, and the two eventually swapped Xboxes. For a while, this is where the saga ended. By 2020 though, questions were again being raised over the optimal load times. Over the Xbox's life cycle, four different companies manufactured disk drives for it. The community had long known that disk drives produced by Samsung were to be the fastest, but were shocked to find out that there were actually two versions of the Samsung drive, with the faster version actually being found in earlier Xboxes. As it would turn out, Snap's 2017 Xbox would feature this faster disk drive, meaning his console had never been modified at all and that he simply did have a god-tier console. The easiest means of cheating though is just lying about your times. While this has become increasingly difficult in a video age, it was especially easy in the earliest days of speedrunning. Back when video proof was not necessary, all a person needed to do was claim to have a time. The most notorious example of this is Todd Rogers and his 551 and Dragster. Rogers claimed this time all the way back in 1982, leading to his ascension as the first professional video game player. Activision was shocked by this claim, stating that by their own simulations, a time faster than 554 should not have been possible. Despite this, they would verify the time by Polaroid, and it would remain the untied record for decades. In 2012, Todd Rogers would be honored by the Guinness World Records for the longest standing video game record for his 551. It wasn't until 2017 when a runner by the name of Omnigamer would disassemble the game's code, revealing it was impossible for a time faster than a 557 to be achieved. <gasps> yeah! Fuck yeah! Oh! In one fell swoop, Omnigamer exposed that not only was Todd Rogers lying about his times, but Activision themselves lied about their times. By this point, unlikely sources began to come out of the woodwork. David Crane is an American game developer, co-founder of Activision, and most relevantly, designer of Drexter. In an interview, Crane stated that he fully believed that Todd achieved and provided the necessary proof for any score he claimed to have set. This came in spite of both his own tests and Omnigamers, concluding that Todd Rogers' time should be impossible, which he explains as, If I did have a theoretical limit, and a player beat it by such a small margin, I would believe that the player found a way to play the game that was different than the assumptions I used in calculating the theoretical. Since this point, Todd Rogers has had all his records removed from Twin Galaxies, is banned from submitting to the site, as well as having his record stripped from Guinness. The last commonly seen method is trick and record hoarding. Hoarding falls into a grey area in speedrunning. It is very rarely explicitly banned, but due to the collaborative nature of speedrunning, it is almost always seen as bad-mannered. When runners fail to disclose they discovered a new trick or set a new record, it allows them to improve while the rest of the community is acting under false pretenses, changing the playing field and creating an imbalance in competition. The most infamous example of this comes from Mario Kart 64. For the longest time, Matthias Rustmeyer had been attempting the impossible. He sought to be the first player to ever hold the world record on each of Mario Kart 64's non-shortcut categories. Mario Kart 64 features 16 tracks, with each track having two non-shortcut records, one for the fastest individual lap, and one for the fastest track completion, for a total of 32 records. Matthias had held 31 out of 32 of the records 8 times before, only to be thwarted by another top level runner setting a new record at the last moment. When the news broke that someone had finally achieved a perfect 32 for 32, most naturally assumed it was Matthias. The only problem was, he wasn't. Instead, it would be Matthias' rival, Dan Burbank. At multiple times during Matthias' grind for perfection, it would be Dan that held him off at the last second. In the summer of 2020, the scene appeared to be at equilibrium, with Matthias on top but still chasing perfection. The system was thrown into chaos though when Dan unhoarded a collection of 17 new world records, catapulting him into first place overnight. This set off a race between Dan and Matthias to see which one of them would accomplish perfection first. Unfortunately for Matthias, he had commitment to attend to outside of speedrunning, giving Dan months of unfettered grinding, and in the end, he would accomplish the task in August of 2021. The community was not happy with Dan's actions though. Shortly after unhoarding his times, Dan would apologize for breaking the community's trust and oppose to the Mario Kart 64 forums. Despite this apology, Matthias, who had been a good sport each and every time someone undercut him on his quest for 32 for 32, is noted as saying that he lost all respect for Dan as a result of the hoarding, and at a point in time even retired from speedrunning because of it. You may notice in Dan's apology though, he mentions Goldeneye. Goldeneye has a similarly storied speedrunning community centered around two James Bond titles on the N64, Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. While it may seem out of place, Goldeneye has a long history of people hoarding records and, unlike most communities, it's celebrated. 
players often come together to create feature-length videos that mix in commentary, music, and jokes with the records to make a viewing experience completely unique from any other in speedrunning. This underlines the complexity of hoarding in speedrunning. While it may not be cheating, most view the practice negatively and look down on those who do it. It's far from universal though. In some communities and cultures, it's perfectly acceptable. There are many runners who don't upload their runs until they have achieved the time they are satisfied with, while others speedrun without knowing that a community even exists. So if this is how speedrunners cheat, it's only natural to wonder why. After all, there's very little glory to speedrunning. Few games are notable enough to be newsworthy, and few runners of those games will make news. The overall proposition is very little reward for the effort expended. A common answer to this question is that cheating is normally done by good players who think they deserve a better time than they have, so they cheat to resolve a chronological dysphoria. While this makes sense, it's also a product of sampling bias. When most people watch a speedrun, they watch the world record. Very few people scroll all the way to the 151st fastest run and watch that. On any given leaderboard, a cheated run may have slipped through the cracks and will never be noticed because no one ever watches it again. An interesting example of this comes from, again, the Minecraft community. Back in 2021, Minecraft was becoming increasingly optimized. This placed a greater emphasis on reaching the stronghold quickly. Normally, to find the stronghold, the player throws an Eye of Ender in the overworld, which travels in a straight line towards the nearest stronghold. While this provides direction, figuring out the distance is a bit harder. When an Eye of Ender is thrown, it always travels towards the center of the chunk where the stronghold is. This means that if the runner can calculate when the Eye of Ender crosses over the center of a chunk, they're able to find the location of the stronghold. The only issue is that it requires doing a little trigonometry. This is where the controversy begins. Trig isn't too difficult, but it's not very accessible without using a calculator. Solving most trig problems by hand requires memorizing a huge number of figures or using a table with references on it. In contrast, to solve problems using a calculator is just plugging in a few numbers. Some runners viewed the use of calculators to be akin to creating a tool-assisted run, leading to it being initially banned from runs. The issue is, this rule is virtually unenforceable. A runner could simply pause their game and take 15 seconds to plug the data into their calculator and their moderation team would have no way of proving that they were not calculating the location by hand. The rule was so blatantly misguided that it was receiving flack from unlikely sources. A leaderboard mod by the name of Floor would submit a run with the time of 1706 in September of 2021. By the time it was verified in October of 2021, it was a respectable 249th place on the leaderboards. Floor had long been a pioneer of the technical side of Minecraft speedrunning, helping to create tools, methods, and guides for many of the most advanced strategies in Minecraft speedrunning. At the time he submitted his run, the use of calculators was banned by the moderation team. Four, on the other hand, was a vocal advocate for the use of calculators, in part due to the inability to effectively enforce a ban on them. To prove his point, he would risk his position and reputation in the community by submitting a run that uses a calculator. As expected, the run would be verified and no one suspected a thing. Two months later, calculators would be unbanned following a community vote. In the end, the rules of most communities are decided by a small number of people who may or may not represent the opinions of the community. Sometimes they create rules that miss the mark. Much like how activists protest against unfair laws, speedrunners will cheat to underline flaws in the rules. Another project that provides unique insight into why speedrunners cheat was undertaken by Flibbity Dibbity and the Super Mario Bros. 1 community. In November of 2021, the community came together and overlapped all of the sub-5 runs into one video. The project initially was supposed to show all the runs in the leaderboards, leading to every single run being reviewed. Of the hundreds of runs, two of them were found to be cheated, with both using the rewind feature that is present on the Switch port of the game. Rather than being a malicious plot, both of these runs appear to have been performed by children, making it possible they didn't even know they were cheating. To boil down all of cheating to one simple reason ignores the complexities of the matter. Not all speedrunners are looking for glory and prestige. Many are just pursuing a hobby however they see fun. Cheating doesn't always have to be about deceit or betrayal. Sometimes, it's just a kid who wants to go fast. 